What's up? I'm here in the Hollywood Hills with my friend Kerry Gordy. Hey, what's up? Kerry Gordy is also known as Professor Gordy because he's someone who's teaching me a lot about brand building in both the music industry and also just in business in general about how to build my personal brand. He's doing that himself, but he's also done it with some of the most amazing talent out there from Prince to helping Smokey Robinson with copyright protection. He's somebody who has networked the whole landscape of the entertainment world. He also comes from an amazing family, the Gordy family. His father created Motown Records, his brother's Red Foo from LMFMO, and he has built an amazing network. He's a really social guy. He's able to build an amazing social circle super fast because when you get to know him, even on a first meeting, you feel like you've known this guy for years. It's, a, it's an awesome skill set to have. Thanks so much for coming down here. Well, first of all, uh I thought that introduction was amazing, but uh, can I curse? Yeah, absolutely. Good. <laughs> okay. I just wanted to know. I wanted to be. I wanted to be clear. Okay. Good. Well, I, I guess I'd love to start off and just talk about your hero's journey because I think that's the thing that our audience loves more than anything else. I don't. I mean, okay. Hero's journey. You know, my my hero ness started uh, in the Motown mailroom. Well, no, actually, it started uh, being born. <laughs> you know, okay. coming home to the, you know, that big Hitsville thing where all the stars were recording and all of that kind of stuff. So it started having a family of people like Diana Ross and Smokey Robinson, and Stevie Wonder and Lionel Richie and Rick, De you know, that's that's how it started. But uh, as it grew, you know, I had a, a great uh, ability to um, do anything I wanted because, you know, my father owned the company. So started in the mailroom, went through A&R, went through business affairs, finance, uh, marketing, creative, the whole shot publishing. And I just got a chance to learn everything. And by the time uh, uh, my father sold the company, um, I was, you know, ready to go out and do my own thing, went over and uh, became a consultant. Consultant. Then I ran Prentice Company, Paisley Park Records, right? And we had a, a, a great time there, a few, few big hit records, and then went and ran the urban division of Warner Brothers, then managed Rick James and uh, um, uh, did a great uh, a great deal with Beachbody, their first big deal with Debbie Sievers. We did over $150 million in, um, in billing, uh, creating exercise videos. And uh, now I'm doing copyright recapture and I'm recapturing copyrights for all of my clients who assign their copyrights to these major uh, conglomerates when they were young and now I'm getting them back for them and it's millions and millions of dollars. Smokey Robinson and Norman Whitford heard it through the grapevine and ain't too proud to beg and all of those kind of songs. Either we're going to get them back or we, either we've gotten them back for them or we've gotten them majorly paid. So, you know, I am the Robin Hood of the music business. Now we were talking earlier today about how your passions are now going towards the process of self-actualization and spirituality as you as a professor and your passion for educating and helping other people. What is it that you're interested in teaching the most that you feel like you have amazing value in terms of teaching other people? I don't know, you know, I think the thing that is uh, most important about me and my life is that I'm happy. And I think that happiness is the most important thing. I think it's, it's more important than money. I think it's more important than almost everything. So health, happiness, and love are the three things that are most important to me. And business will happen for you if you love what you do. Every day when I wake up, I love what I do. I love the people I'm around that I'm around. So uh, my philosophy, you know, starts with that. Do what makes you happy. And if you do what makes you happy and you love it, you'll be good at it. Absolutely. Because you'll work harder at it. Well, you, because you aren't working. Definitely. You're, you're working with people that you love as opposed to not working at all. I That's feel like I wouldn't even want to work if I'm not working with people I like. Where it's a position that you have to build, you know, in order to get that position, yeah. you're very fortunate. But yeah. it's a position that you have to build. Yes. I guess I, I think that one of the interesting things about what you're doing is you also stayed in the music business from being a kid where your wingman was Michael Jackson to still staying your entire career now still in the music business. So your passion must circle also much around music itself. Well, well my passion does, uh, is, is, is around music. My mother was a child prodigy and she played 11 instruments and she wrote all of those, you know, all of those um, 
uh, arrangements that you heard in the early Motown days, those were my mother's arrangements. And all of those background vocals and arrangements, those were my mother's uh, arrangements. And, and even her voice when you hear, that's what I want. That's my mother uh -huh. in the background. You know, when, when Barrett Strong is saying, give me money or, or a stubborn kind of fellow with Marvin Gaye, do, do, do. That's my mother, right? So, that's awesome. So, yeah, right? I didn't know that. That's amazing. You know what? It's really funny. That's the first time I've ever said that in an interview. I, it, just, it just came up. My, my family have been so influential for me because they're both educators. And now I'm in the education business, just that it's not in the formal education. My mom is a kindergarten teacher. Yes. And my dad was president of Rye. Uh -huh. Now, oh my gosh. I started off you know, seeking so much knowledge, I felt like if I wasn't in the library, I'm missing out. Yes. I would uh, even be walking between classes. I'm still reading books because I felt like if I wasn't knowing something, I'd miss out. I'm st I still have that fear now. Right. Um, well, so you're a lifetime learner. I've been in college for 15 years. That's right. You know, I, did, I did my undergrad at University of Wisconsin, yes. math and economics. Uh -huh. Then I went to do my first MBA program at Lloyd Marymount University, yep. second one at USC, yep. USC Film School. Uh -huh. Um, for the cinematic arts, right. then uh, Cornell for hotel school. Wow. Now I'm at Harvard for law. And wow. after this, I'll probably uh, do something in the West Coast, like Stanford or UCLA. Or You're probably like, perhaps the most educated person <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, my daughter is like getting a great education, but you know, my I got my education at Motown. It, when people say, "Well, where'd you go to school?" I go, "Oh, I went to Motown U." <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> because your your parents are such a huge influence on you. Like mine have been on me, and it's kind of edu turned my career where my whole life I'm stuck in academia, but in a really out of the box way of thinking. Now you're in music, but you're also approaching brands and how the music is, and tr also doing out of the box, turning things upside down. Well, it's, in an, it's, it's definitely in an out of the box way. You know, it's like people say, oh, the music business is bad now, and you know, you can't make any money. The internet is, you know, kids are um, they're downloading for free, and, and people aren't getting paid, and the music business is in bad shape. And I'm like, what are you talking about? The music business is in the best shape it's ever been. You just have to understand how to maneuver and how to work it because the music business is not just the music business now, it's the intellectual property business. And you have to understand the nature of how to create that intellectual property, how to monetize that intellectual property, how to create derivatives of, 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 of those intellectual properties that you create and how to monetize those in a, in a, in a, in a myriad of ways. Let's talk about that approach of what you're doing versus what the traditional music worlds look like and like how are you taking the artists that were stuck in this old world and how are you bringing them to this new world new generation well it's really funny because um i really it's it's funny i have a new um um i have a new way of thinking about how things need to be done but it's really funny i don't want to discuss that and the reason I don't want to discuss it is because I'm putting together this incredible umbrella of, uh, you know, of technology and, 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 and the way that I'm going to, that I'm doing things. And it doesn't seem like anybody has done it yet. And I want to be the first to do it, so I don't want to tell exactly what I'm doing. But so keep your line, keep your eyes on what he's doing. <laughs> you don't hear about it, right? But the bottom line, the but but the bottom line is what I just said. What I just said. Um, um, if you create an intellectual property, whether it's a record or whether it's a song or whether it's a TV show or whether it's a movie, you have to understand that those things have a finite life. But our job is to create those things and to live on forever way after those things are dead and gone. That reminds me of what Tony Shea told me. He was talking to us about how we have this intellectual property in dating, but he couldn't figure out a way to increase the customer lifetime values. So my business partner and I create the game plan to extend ourselves. So after someone gets married, we have the health and fitness, we have the business, we have the self-improvement. And so our goal is to extend that finite lifetime value and also break into that larger niche. Because I don't believe that our company could break into where we are now and make it into a company that's 
multiple times larger without extending our reach into new artists well, or new new um, aspects. Well, first of all, there <laughs> we need to talk after this interview because there are a plethora of ways that you can uh, expand because intellectual property is about your ability to think it and to to do it. You're you're you're. You're, you're monetizing a thought process. You aren't monetizing a physical thing. So there are countless of way, countless ways that you can expand your brand, countless, countless. And you already have the platform to do it. So now you just have to be creative with a, a bunch of creative people around you saying, oh, wait a minute, this fits our brand. The only thing that you have to remember is never go outside your brand because people know it. Your audience knows that your brand is, is, is what it is. And so they stick with, their, with it and they're loyal to it. If you do stuff for money or uh, uh, for any other reason, you'll, you'll, you'll lose that audience. Mm -hmm. So stick with your brand and, and it'll work and, and you can create so much intellectual property, it's amazing just based on what you've done already. Yeah, that loyalty to your people. I think that's yes. such a powerful thing. I think that's our probably, other than trust, the number one thing out there. I remember in 2014, we had one of our executives got in trouble with the media. And the people that were in the media were like, oh, just, just get rid of him. But doing that would betray not just him, but also her whole brand, because the concept of us as a company, the reason why people follow us, is a fraternalness, a fraternity, a, a, and a fraternity and a brotherhood of uh, loyalty, good guys who are working together, innovating, and if we were just going to follow what someone else tells us to do, it just doesn't work for us. Well, pro pro provided he's not the Boston Strangler. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he's not the Boston Strangler. <laughs> right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I agree. Or I actually, actually, the Boston Strangler. I think that some of the people in the media thought that he was way worse. But <laughs> But That's funny. Not actually the yeah, yeah, yes, right, exactly. Um, exactly. But I, I love the, the ideas that you were bringing to me about how you thought that I needed to focus on developing my brand more because my YouTube channel, right now it is uh, the summer of 2017. I'm about 40 to 50,000 subscribers and growing. And I think that it's only been about a year of me really focusing on building my personal brand. It's always been about the company's brand. You know, so it'd be like Motown as opposed to Gordy. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that it's been a, a really fun focus for me because I've always been behind the scenes, purposefully though. Um, I wanted to be kind of the person just tinkering with the business and making relationships with higher level CEOs and doing things from behind the scenes. I think a lot of it also came from the influence I got from Tony Shea because he's been a, right. a friend of mine for almost two decades now. And he always told me if he had a chance to change one thing in his past. He wished that he could change a situation where he could make money without being famous. Mm -hmm. And I was trying to do that, but I felt like, you know, that's what he says he wished, but actually it might have been a lot easier just because he was putting himself out there. And so that convinced me to say, you know, do what he does, not just necessarily what he wishes if he could have made happen. Because, yeah, I wish there was a world where I could just push a button and gold reigns. But you have to hustle in this real world. You got to work really hard. And um, that's why I'm also known in this company for being the guy that has historically gone five days without sleep just hustling. But I've done stuff like that. I've done things like, um, you know, world tours and stuff like that. But it makes a story. And it's a story that's interesting to me. I mean, you talked about doing amazing things, but what people don't see is below the surface of what it took for you to do that, the conflicts, the things oh, that well, fall apart. Still to this day, I don't sleep. <laughs> I mean, I really, I, I, I really, you know, I'm up at one and two in the morning and my, I'm, my mind is always thinking, but I'm doing it out of love because I really love what I do. But let me digress to what you just said. Um, the one thing, one day, 
I was with um, my father, Diana Ross, and Michael Jackson, uh, and we were walking up some corridor, and as, as we were walking up the corridor, all these fans came out and they, they ran and they said, uh, oh, can we have your autograph and blah, 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 and they just stormed Michael and Diana. And, and, they were, and Michael and Diana were signing autographs and everything, and I turned to my father and I said, oh my gosh, look how lucky they are, look how great it is, the, you know, all these people love them. And he said, I just want to tell you, son, it's better to be us than it is to be them. Because the one thing you can never do is undo fame. You can not have money, but you'll still be famous, <laughs> right? So the fact is, is that we get to live our lives and we get to live our lives uh, without the burden of being under that level of microscope. So, so you have to look at it both ways. Now, I'm at the point in my life where I've seen everything, I've done everything, I've traveled, I've done everything fairly anonymously. And right now I'm like, okay, I'm ready for some fame. <laughs> I'm ready for some fame. I'm ready to, to let people know uh, what I do. I'm ready to spit the knowledge and to give the anecdotes that people need to, that people need to hear and people need to know about. You know, I've had a great life. Rick James and Lionel Richie and Stevie Wonder. And you know, it's, 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 it's just amazing the, the experiences that I've had. Uh, Prince, and it's crazy. And wherever I go, people want to hear the stories. And I have so many of them to share that it just becomes part of my being. So when I'm telling you about, you know, how to uh, get into the record business or how to promote a record or how to market something or whatever I'm telling you, and I throw in the little story about the Michael Jackson, what he did at this point or what Prince did or how Prince was in the studio or, you know, People like, they were like, wow, that's amazing. And you're so fortunate. And I am. I'm blessed and I'm fortunate. It's, it's well, I see a sparkle in your eye when you're talking about putting yourself out there and, and your whole face brightens up. Yeah. What is it that is inspiring you to want to do that? What's inspiring me is that three times in my life, I've made people over $100 million. Okay, and I've done the work and I was down there doing what I had to do. And, you know, I was paid uh, reasonably well and, you know, I live reasonably good. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, is that they made the hundred million dollars. Right. And I'm, my focus has always been to build other people. And I'm just saying, you know what, at this point in my life, why should I do that? Let me build myself. And this is literally the, I, I would say this is the uh, second interview that I've ever done wow. where, I'm, where, where I'm actually uh, talking about, you know, branding myself. I haven't had my first meeting, but my first meeting is going to be next week where I'm talking about, okay, let's get down and let's have some fun. So Yeah, that's, that's great. The, that's, that's, that's what it is. Well, the, the intricacies of what you've learned in the field, uh, I think is amazing. It's very unique. And what you did in terms of calling it kind of like Motown University, yep. I hear that at uh, Sony Pictures. I'll say Sony Pictures is like undergrad. And if you work at an agency afterwards, maybe that'll be like your grad school. Mm -hmm. Now, in terms of like your curriculum, in terms of like what Motown University taught you, I'd say there was like a degree what would say your concentration be when you're at Motown University and growing up in terms of what you were focusing on learning? Well, first of all, um, the key is quality product on time, on budget. You have to make sure that no matter what, you have taken care of your break even. Because, yes, it's music, but it's business too. And you have to be cognizant of, uh, of the business in the music. Our stuff has got to be better than everybody else's stuff. It can't be as good, especially if I'm dealing with a new artist. It has to be better because the game out here is about money. And if I'm going to radio with my record, Okay, and I have a new artist 
and Justin Bieber comes out and Ariana Grande comes out or, or whoever is the big star at the time, their records come out at the same time as mine and they aren't as good, they're still going to get the love at radio. They're going to have big budgets behind them and the fact of the matter is, is my little funky record, if it's even better, is not going to get the love. You know why? It's a money game. When, you, when the record goes on the radio, physically people are going to be listening to that to that radio and they're going to hear this new artist and some people are going to change the channel just because they aren't familiar when that channel changes the radio loses money because they lose advertising for every time that 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 channel's changed so they can't take a chance at putting something like my stuff on their um on their station unless it is out of the box unless it is unbelievable so we have to be not as good as everybody we have to be better when my father put out the Jackson 5 he's like I'm, I'm their their first th three records are gonna be number one records everybody said you can't say that this is a brand new group he says I don't want it if it's not number one and if it's not number one don't come to me with it right and consequently their first three records first three records I want you back ABC, The Love You Save, number one. Then they put out I'll Be There, number one. First time in the history of the business that a brand new act had four number one records in a row. So it's about quality and it's about caring and it's about, you know, uh, also don't, don't care what other people say. If, if I believe it's a hit, then I go after it. And by the way, Dinah Ross and the Supremes, their first six records flopped. Nobody knows that. But we said, listen, if they fail, it's not their fault. It's our fault because we didn't do something right. We didn't do the marketing right. We didn't do the promotion right. We didn't do the publicity right. It's our fault because once we picked them and we produced the records and we did everything we, we, we knew we had to do, it's not their fault because we picked people we knew were great. Now the conventional wisdom has said, if an artist comes out and they don't hit, then oh, there must be something wrong with the artist because the companies wouldn't take responsibilities. But we always took responsibility. We always had a very small roster. Everybody thought we had a huge roster because we had a very high hit to miss ratio. But the fact of the matter is, is we carried about 20 artists on our rosters when Sony and, and, and Universal and all these other companies were carrying 300. But people thought we had a lot because we had a very high hit to miss ratio. I love the responsibility that's accepted from that. And that is so much power. I, I love that responsibility of taking responsibility for all the risks and failures right there. And that's just truly amazing. And that's something that you almost, it's just so rare to hear something like that. My, my um, ethos and values that you feel, I just feel that synergy. I, I love that. It's so awesome. I, I totally agree with everything that you said. And I think that most people forget that because you're right. Most people, even, even uh, I know, for example, I was talking to the people who are at Sony mm -hmm. and they were saying the reason Sony why, pictures? Sony Pictures, because uh -huh. I, I won a charity auction for the next two weeks to be an yeah. apprentice in yeah. the, the nucleus of Sony. And they, I was talking to the production team about what is it they're actually looking for. And they said, well, Nick, we're looking for that project that is about to cross the finish line. It's at the one, year, one yard line, and it's about to cross over. And if it's not that, we're not going to take it to the next level. We're not even gonna consider it. And then the reason why is because every single aspect of what we have to do after that is we're gonna invest everything we have into it. And that mindset that you have here, I think that is really the heart of what true success is in enterprise. But you know what? That's a problem. And let no, me, no, let me, let me that, tell you that's what a you're problem. talking about. Not, no, not, not no, with that. No, no, yeah. no. I'm saying what you just said is a little bit of a problem okay. because you have, listen to this, you have uh, a guy who's worked his life hard work. <laughs> uh, I know. You know and, years. And, and years and years, and he's been writing and everything. And then he turns it into this major company, and then they give it to this guy who just came in as an apprentice to tell for, them for whether it's something. Bring it from the cherry <laughs> <I, I>, <laughs> They won't even look at it that, that, unless I tell them to that, look at it. That's what I'm saying.
thing. That's crazy. That's crazy. I mean, I know. That's I, I'm shocked by that too. But you know, I'm but obviously, well. obviously, they felt something special about you to give you that level of responsibility. But I would hate to be yeah. the guy who's been doing this for 20 years. Uh, for staying in the job, yeah. I had to decline. <laughs> That's right. I, I, did, I did not recommend three projects my first day. Wow. And I'm thinking, wow, if I spent years of my life, right. I, I, I know way, that because I'm focusing on the way, you may right be now. You may be incredibly good. You may be incredibly good. You may be incredibly good, but you may not. I know. <laughs> okay. So, but golly, that's 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 incredible. See, we would have never put that level of responsibility on someone who was just coming into the business yeah. because it, there 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 are too many things to know. Like it, it, with regard to a song, I have to understand. You know that that that. Uh, that beginning, it needs to, it needs to hit you. Uh, the the lyric needs to be, uh, it needs to be chronological from the verse to the chorus. The chorus needs to be the payoff to what is said in the in the verse. You know, the melody has to be, um, uh, it has to be something that you love to sing, but it can't be monotonous. You know, it's it's all of these things that you just have to know from experience that somebody off the street may not quite know. Yeah. Right, but this is that's an interesting, that's an interesting scenario. Yeah, I mean, I guess what just just so you know uh, the process, just just for for entertainment purposes, it is. I went in there and I reviewed three scripts that they already green lighted. One of them I'm really looking forward to, which is Equalizer Two, because yeah. I loved Equalizer One. Right. Um, and then I talked about the coverage of it. You know the elements of the story. What, what I thought about the character development, um, what kind of genre I thought it was, and what movies it was a combination of, and then I talked about the the whether there was plot holes or not, the action sequences whether it fit well. I mean, a lot of the stories are not action sequences, right. um, and I think that one of the things that helped a lot was that I sent many people in my creative team to learn about screenwriting, but not for the sake of screenwriting, but for the sake of storytelling. Uh -huh. For whether you're on stage or elsewhere, from a guy named Robert McKee. Uh -huh. And he's a guy who's worked with every producer except for Spielberg. And he, he's known for quoting this in the media. Uh, he's a Pulitzer Prize winning educator for screenwriters about how to build a story. He wrote his awesome book called Story. Um, so I think that the elements of good storytelling help you to convey your brand, your marketing, etc. And we've never really gotten to the scripted Entertainment. That's what the one thing that I'm really interested in breaking into now. That's why we originally were having me work on business education music videos, which turned into the concept of making a musical theater production, which turned into the possibility now of a TV series, which is what I'm talking to the people at Sony about. It's just been it's new to us. I see also the ideas that people like uh, Alex Siskin. I won a charity auction with him. He has his own production company. And his idea was very similar to yours. He was, but his idea was to create a new media company. I mean, we have hundreds of cinema cameras, or at least over 100, almost 200. We've spent millions of dollars in gear, and we have people that make YouTube videos, but never scripted television, never scripted shows. And I think that we could actually learn that skill set pretty fast and take the other skills of video editing, video production, marketing, putting ourselves out there, building an audience, a tribe, and loyalty, and using that to uh, attract attention. That's why I'm really interested in studying scripts and stories, yeah, even though right, I'm new to right, it. Right, right, no. Yeah. No, first of all, what you're doing is, is, is amazing uh, that, you would, that you would do that because um, it's real. And it's, it's not hypothetical. It's what happens in the real world. What I was saying um, to you earlier is that's the real world that everybody else has to deal with. Yeah. But uh, at some level, I... I try my best to only deal with the people at the top because they can say no. I mean, they can say yes and, um, and, and they can say no, but the people coming up can only tell you no. They can't tell you yes because it has to get to the top for the person, uh, to, for the person to, to, to have to say yes or no. Absolutely. So the fact of the matter is, is that why take it to somebody who dur um, during the process can tell you no, but can't tell you yes? Yeah, yeah. I think that's a, it's a great, great concept yeah. for people to focus on. And it's amazing how people think that it's 
they go through that process because they don't think it's possible to reach that yes person at the top. Um, so many people will, will reach out to me and they say, how do you, you get access to all these people? It doesn't seem to be possible. And it's, it's amazing how you can do that. What are some of the ways you found to get access to people that are the yes people? Well, you know, it's really funny. I, I've been, I've been doing it for so long, and I have such great, such a great contact base. I'm kind of one degree of separation from anybody that I want to get to in the business. If I don't know the person, then I absolutely do know a person that knows that person. And so, I, I think it's just by being, um, by being a fastidious and being a hard worker and having a level of integrity where people know that if you say something that your word is your bond uh, and after you've had a certain amount of success people start to believe in you and they trust in you so you build those relationships and as you grow up as you grow up people grow with you so a lot of people that I started with are now like CEOs of companies so it's a it's a you know it's just uh, I guess a maturation of, of, of coming up, uh, you know, with, with, with people and not giving up and not falling off when things didn't go well. Uh, just, you, you just keep it and keeping that good attitude and understanding that the past does not equal the future, you know, and just keeping it going. You know? I, it reminds me of um, what you're saying early, early there in your, about um, how people do not give up on you and that's so important it reminds me of a friend i had when i was a kid and he told me when you're in tough situations your friends will leave you but family won't so make your close friends your family mm -hmm. and in the asian culture family and and money making are always like number one and uh, that's something that was always ingrained in, in me as well but one thing that they didn't ingrain was like um you know uh i'm making such a, a large family and I, I think that's been a, a focus of mine because i grew up with such a small soul circle in terms of friendships and i, I changed that i changed that because i got so fascinated by the idea that you could make almost make your make your family so large and as long as people stay with you and they're the kind of they have the kind of values the, that that giving mindset giving value and you have that um, when you're interacting with other people, people will see that in you. And as a result, they want to stay around you and be around you. And that's a thing I got. I, lo I love that concept of being able to have that mindset, not even expecting anything back, and more likely to build relationships, get people to build things with you and be successful if you have that mindset. It's kind of like when we talk about approaching girls to our clients. If they're more likely to not rely on an outcome, they're more likely to get that outcome because they're so focused on just being the right kind of guy as opposed to getting that girl in a certain situation or getting something from that girl. Um, I think that's it's a great way because that's what family's about. A family, they're with you. They're not expecting anything from you. You just are with your family. You help each other out. It's, it's, it's good. It's well, good value. Well, well, also the golden rule. You know, um, if you treat people like you'd like to be treated um, and you're loyal to your people, um, in most cases, they'll be loyal back to you. Um, I find that um, people don't work as hard for money as they do for appreciation. And if you give them appreciation and they love what they do, they'll make money because they'll be motivated and they'll be motivated to be there for you. Everybody that works with and for me I absolutely, totally love um, and like. I like them and I love them. And, um, and I feel that they love me and I feel that they protect me. And um, there's a mutual respect for everybody. So um, I just, I, 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 I agree with you. I, lo I, love your, I love your mindset and all these ideologies. It just so, it just so reminds me of, of, of the right mentality of being a proper businessman and the hustler mentality and the right values and everything and that's one of the inspiring things about doing these interviews that's why i so appreciate you coming down you know here. what i feel this has been awesome <laughs> i feel like um and i i hate to say this because it's it's it might sound egotistical but i feel like 
once people work with me, they're going to be really spoiled because the rest of the world doesn't, doesn't play like I play. The rest of the world is more of a me, me, me mentality. And I like to share everything. I like to share um, my contacts with people. I like to share my experiences. I like to, when I travel, I like to, you know, take someone off of my staff who's never been out of the uh, country. You know, I love that kind of stuff. I love giving those experiences. And, um, and it's just, it, it just makes me happy. Oh, and I also like developing people. Some of the people that have worked for me have gone on to become multi, multi millionaires. And it just makes me so happy. And, and they're, 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 they're incredible friends of mine to this day. And we just have a, a, a great relationship because it was always about family and love. Awesome. Thanks, brother. That was amazing. Yeah. Cheers. It's great. Thank you.